Good afternoon, everyone. And this is Lorraine Fernandez. I'm one of the co-presenters for today's webcast, Privacy of Health Information and IPHEMA Global Perspective. And I say good afternoon knowing some of you are hearing this live on Mountain Time Zone, like Jean and I are on, and others of you will be hearing this on demand. So greetings, no matter when you listen to us or what time of day it is. As I said, I'm Lorraine Fernandez. I am the president of IPHEMA, the International Federation of Health Information Management Associations, and I am the principal of my own data governance consulting group. I'm delighted today that joining me is Jean Eaton, who was the work group chair for IPHEMA in writing the white paper we're going to talk about today. Jean hails, as I hinted, uh, from the mountain region where I live. She lives in Edmonton, Alberta, and she has her own privacy practice management information managers. So thank you so much for joining us. We wanted to start our webcast with giving a sense of who our listeners are so that we can tailor our content and our comments here a little bit to who all of you might be. So if you'd be kind enough to take our poll and let us know what drove you to this webcast so that we might reflect a little bit better in our comments what, uh, what your experience is around healthcare and specifically healthcare privacy. So the poll will be open for a couple of minutes and in the meantime, or a couple of seconds actually. In the meantime, let me share with you the goals of our webcast and the time we're going to spend these 45 minutes or so. So the first thing we're going to do is overview IFHEMA and what its global role is. We're going to talk a bit about historical and new privacy standards and regulations. We'll explore the privacy perspectives related to culture because we've certainly seen that as we've talked privacy around the world. And then talk about some of the key components of privacy management and some real takeaways for you uh, as you leave this webcast. And it looks like, based upon the voting that has come in, all of you, or almost all of you, are saying the reason you came is you have a general interest in privacy, perhaps it's healthcare privacy, or just other interest in the topic that we're covering. So thank you so much for joining us, and we appreciate your feedback. I do see uh, there are a couple of people who are privacy officers in healthcare as we close the poll. So thank you much, one and all, for joining us. So let's move forward and talk about IFTIMA, the organization that I specifically represent. I came to IFTIMA about six years ago uh, to the board. We are a global organization, as this slide shows you, of 23 member organizations around the globe. We are modeled after the six World Health Organization regions. I am current president and I've served uh, six years on the board before becoming president. We have official relationships with a number of other professional healthcare organizations around the globe. Probably the most important and relevant to this health data, health classification, and today what we're talking about health privacy is the World Health Organization. We are the non-governmental organization, the NGO that has official relationships with the World Health Organization representing the health information management community that Jean and I hail from. Several others as you see on this slide that we have relationships with also around the globe. So the objectives of IFHEMA, as you see on this slide, are really to promote the quality and the use of patient records and health information globally. Obviously going hand in hand with that is understanding and emphasizing and supporting the global privacy standards, some that will be national, some that will be regional out there. We have a a great affinity to the developing nations that are amongst the 23 member nations of IFEMA. So everything that IFEMA does, including this privacy white paper we're discussing with you, has an eye towards how do we uh, 
raise the tide for health information management and all of the topics related to that and related to health care that <clears throat> we feel are very important to raising global health around the world. And when we close this session out, we'll talk a bit about some calls to action that you might think are unique to health information management, but really I think when it comes to privacy are relevant to a much broader uh, platform that you might work with. So our mission and our vision, no surprise, given our 23 member nations, is to promote, promote health information management. And our vision is a healthy world enabled by quality health information. Certainly in the context of privacy, we could talk about that vision being protecting the key importance of privacy of health information. Our values are leadership, integrity, mutual respect, and collaboration across the six World Health Organizations, across our 23 member nations, certainly a part of every conversation we have with the World Health Organization, our individual members, our corporate members, and we have a new membership category, which is educational institutions around the globe. So these are the values that drive our work, and certainly these are the values that Dean and I and the diverse members of our privacy work group talked about as we developed this content. <clears throat> so the graphic that you see here really is just to begin to orient you to what we talked about over the roughly nine months where Jean led this work group when we talked about what's the importance of privacy of health information, why is it core to the health information management profession, but on a broader level, why is it core, core to healthcare, to building trust, to delivering value, to engaging the patients and the consumers? Um, so it really, these six steps that you see here have a broader application really beyond privacy to how do we work with health data to get the true value out of the data that is collected and used on an everyday basis when we think about improving healthcare. So the, the various members of the work group that Jean led, as I said, over the nine months when we developed this, this paper was released officially at the IPIMA Triennial Con Congress which was held in Dubai in the United Arab Emirates in mid-November. So the names that you see listed on this side represent countries like Canada, the US, Australia, Germany, India, Qatar, Jamaica, uh, and then a couple of more from India. So we had very good global representation in this work group, which I really think reflects in our content that it is rich, it is cognizant of the fact that there are cultural variations, there are regulatory variations, and there are different perspectives based upon where countries are at in, in developing a stronger privacy ethic for healthcare, in developing the funding and the delivery and the access for healthcare all of the demands that come to healthcare today really irrespective of what nation in the world you might be in whatever component you might be practicing in healthcare. So as we developed this paper, we were very mindful of the fact that privacy standards certainly are global, and we'll talk about GDPR for just a second, but, and they are new like GDPR is. But they go back decades, and we were, we were very cognizant, and we actually discussed it in the white paper, some of the earlier standards that started in the 60s and the 70s and 80s, like the Fair Information Practice Principles, the Caldecott Principles in the UK, certainly HIPAA in the United States. I happen to hail from Northwest Montana, so I'm very familiar with HIPAA. We talk a bit about GDPR, not because GDPR is the driver for healthcare privacy, 
because many nations have very specialized healthcare privacy standards and regulations, and we do touch on that certainly in the case studies that are included here. But we talk about GDPR because of the very large impact and the very broad impact it's having across the world as various nations are getting ready to either refine and enhance their privacy regulations. Perhaps if it's a developing nation, they're, they're actually writing privacy regulations from scratch. Maybe they're addressing privacy in the context of health information because they're implementing their first or second or maybe even third generation electronic medical record. So lots of privacy standards that we talk about in this paper <clears throat> and as well as global privacy standards that have far reaching implications beyond just what's happening in healthcare and in um, managing and securing and building that trusted health information so that you and I as consumers can believe that our healthcare data is secured, it's maintained according to privacy standards forever we, may, we might live. So <clears throat> we have some very robust discussions around historical privacy standards and new ones that are coming. So why privacy now? This is probably pretty obvious to you if you're on this webcast. There are so many things changing with healthcare transformation around the world, with the digitization of data. Uh, I happen to have heard Dr. Tony Cosgrove, who when I heard him at Cleveland Clinic is where he was about 18 months ago or two years ago, he talked about the fact that by the year 2020, and yes, we are here, that healthcare was going to double every 73 days, the amount of health information, health data. And I think we're certainly seeing that in the headlines today, that the, the expansion, the rapid growth of health data, the increasingly mobile world that we live in both in our personal and our professional lives, and the fact that in this mobile world, we, we are very mobile patients, consumers, citizens, travelers. So the, the privacy regulations reach far beyond the, the boundaries of whatever nation we might live in, and we need to be very cognizant of that, particularly in healthcare as we travel, as data is used for research and clinical care, and as artificial intelligence and machine learning and lots of other technologies are being applied to that data that is becoming much more available hopefully still within the privacy regulations that we all have, but that data is truly being used to help control cost, have patients better access to their data, and really deliver higher quality care, which is what you and I as consumers want. So it's critical that the privacy of that individual information be protected throughout the transformation process, as this slide states. A lot is changing in healthcare. We need that change, but we need to ensure with that transformation and change that we are, in fact, maintaining privacy of individual information. <clears throat> we need to maintain the trust in that data. And as that technology is deployed, and it's, it's something new every day, it seems like, in terms of what technology can do with the vast amount of data that's collected, We've got to make sure that we have that privacy, that we have the trust that that privacy is going to be upheld and <clears throat> monitored, and we're going to have audit systems in place so that we truly have trusted, confidential private information. And the last thing I'll talk about here is the stewardship that comes along with building trust. If Pima wrote a governance paper a couple of years ago, I'm lucky I was one of the co-authors for that paper, where we talked about the need to have ground rules to manage the stewardship of data. And that paper didn't dwell heavily on privacy, like this paper is exclusively about privacy, but we touched on stewardship as a key discipline, a key principle, and an ethic related to the handling of information and this privacy, I believe, is a great, and managing it is one of the great examples of stewardship and what the health information profession 
or anyone else in healthcare should be practicing on a day-to-day -day basis as we work with health data. So Jean, I'm gonna turn it over to you and audience, I'm happy to do that. So Jean can take over and talk about why is privacy a globally important topic. Thank you, Lorraine. Um, I'm happy to be here with you for the Data Security uh, Summit with Bright Talk. And I just want to take this opportunity to let our audience know that if you have questions about our discussion today, please go ahead and enter it now in the chat or whenever it occurs to you. And we'll take your questions and take them up at the end of our presentation today. Also on the Bright Talk screen, you will see the uh, button for attachments and links. And we've provided you the links for both the uh, governance white paper and for the IFHEMA uh, privacy white paper. So you can download those white papers uh, for your perusal at a later time. So why is privacy a globally important topic? Well, we live in an increasingly mobile world. Data, like individuals, moves from country to country adding to the challenge of keeping health information private across boundaries. Now, the public's expectation of the privacy of their personal health information in such a way that it makes health information accessible to those authorized persons at the right time to provide health and wellness services and remain compliant to regulations, well, that's why privacy is a priority for business leaders in 2020. The transborder flows of personal health information and the complexity of the regulations around the data subject access, privacy rights, and compliance sanctions incentivizes the avoidance of privacy risks. So as a business, we want to avoid the extra costs about having uh, privacy breaches, penalties, bad public relations, um, and that's another reason why this makes, becomes a business decision. Um, we need to spend some time and resources to build privacy into what we do. Uh, one, because I believe it makes for a more effective, more efficient business proposition, but also to avoid the pain of a lot of uh, penalties and fines that we may incur if we haven't taken those appropriate and reasonable safeguards. This environment challenges privacy and health information management professionals to keep abreast of applicable privacy legislation and to ensure that organizations appropriately implement and comply with the regulations. Healthcare, healthcare organizations are obligated to know and to respond to regulations outside of their service area as health information is increasingly shared across jurisdictions and across nations. Establishing a common privacy standard across healthcare systems supports better decision making at an individual, organization, regional, national, and international level. Privacy standards across the world. Um, we previously mentioned privacy regulations like HIPAA. But we also need to remember that there are other types of legislation that also impact the privacy of health information. Many countries or regions have implemented specific legislation that addresses the unique health information management and privacy needs and risks of specific physical and mental health conditions. For example, regulation specific to mental health, sexual health, infectious diseases, public health, and more. So as a privacy professional and you're reviewing what you need to uh, meet as far as privacy compliance um, standards, we have our, our name brand privacy legislation that is applicable to your, your jurisdiction. But remember that other types of legislation also have privacy and security requirements. So it's not just the HIPAAs and the GDPRs of the world. There are other healthcare-specific legislation that also impacts on our privacy compliance decisions. In many cases, these regulations have been in place for decades. Other countries are currently developing or revising these regulations to reflect their respective cultural norms. As health information moves from paper-based records to digital, the need for defining and applying robust privacy principles has accelerated. 
data is still being used for its originally intended purposes, but also for magnitude of other purposes, sometimes without patients or consumers' knowledge and without proper oversight being applied. Information sharing agreements and information management agreements help to define the rights and the responsibilities between the users of personal health information. In 2019, EFEMA hosted um, a privacy workshop at the, at the Congress. In preparation for the workshop, the committee undertook a survey of EFEMA members' nations regarding their perspectives about privacy laws. And there were 79 responses from the survey from 13 different countries. It's interesting to note that the differences of the perspectives regarding the progress of privacy laws. For example, uh, Saudi Arabia alone provided 17 responses to the survey. One respondent said that the laws, that privacy laws did not exist. Eight said that they exist, but they were not fully implemented. Four said that there were good progress on implementation, and one said that the laws were fully implemented. So even from within one jurisdiction, the perception of the progress may differ from region to region and from setting to setting. So if the issue is just perception, then education becomes a really important role. And that's something that we see as a priority for both privacy professionals and health information management professionals. Nearly every country cited that the lack of education regarding healthcare privacy was a barrier to healthcare privacy. So again, this highlights the need for privacy and HIM professionals to get out there and to educate. So this is absolutely one of the important roles that we have. Technology, in, technology impacts privacy. Um, technology is both a benefit and a risk to privacy and health information management. Technology can add privacy enabling safeguards document compliance, improve transparency, and improve patient access to their own information. Technology must be built and implemented with appropriate privacy rules and practices in mind. We all know about putting privacy in at the beginning of a project and not as an afterthought. Systems must be designed and deployed to support health record privacy in a consistent way that was con consistent with cultures, regulations, and policy. This requires that privacy decisions and rules be understood by the developers and the users and applied consistently at each stage of development in technology-driven initiatives. That's part of our stewardship obligation. So again, we need to make sure that the people that are organizing or are driving the technology part of our system understand the privacy rules and regulations. So just because you can doesn't mean that you should. And if your job in technology is to make sure that it, you know, the, the processes work, it doesn't necessarily mean that you understand what we can and should not be doing. So that becomes a really important role for our privacy professionals is to make sure that we're translating the information about what we can do um, and meet pri privacy compliance requirements uh, to the technology folks who understand how to put all of the gizmos and wheels together to make sure that the information goes appropriately uh, through the um, technology pipes. So again, those information sharing and information management agreements play a really important role for each of those steps to make sure that we have really clear and consistent expectations about how information is going to be used and transmitted um, to other individuals and, and uh, systems. In the white paper, we talked about uh, case studies exploring privacy scenarios related to cultural norms. And I think that this is something that makes the white paper unique and in my mind, uh, really special. For example, we talked about release of information policy as it relates to situations like a privileged spouse premarital screening results, or records of minors and legal guardians. Access to care and consent and consideration of family hierarchy 
and roles in decision making. Consent for treatment for domestic abuse and STDs uh, for minors, for example. And husbands, gathering the husband's information on admission. Patient portal access and the concept about proxy access and duration of proxy access becomes a really important discussion um, in each organization and each jurisdiction that may also reflect those cultural norms. Health information exchange scenarios, including consent types, whether you opt in or opt out of um, consenting to sharing information, and differing privacy practices and managing conflict of interest. So the white paper talks about these um, concepts and provides examples and some background uh, that makes for very interesting reading. Um, now, I know that some of us are what I might call privacy wonks, and we think that this is pretty interesting reading um, most of the time. But for some of us, we need some of that um, um, hands-on examples, and I think the white paper will uh, provide that. The privacy regulations and standards include establishing privacy practices with a cultural alignment. So, when we consider morbidity and mortality data and how that information might be used, we need to be uh, cognizant of how people will see that information and how it might be used. For example, releasing the personal health information about the gender of the fetus uh, following a routine obstetrical ultrasound often triggers additional privacy practices and policies in an organization. The downstream users of this information, for example, in health information exchanges, also need to respect that sensitivity of this information. And those are some of those privacy concerns that we need to build into our, our, our information exchange system. So other examples include the um, concerns regarding uh, familial genetic predisposition. Um, how genetic information may provide information about that one individual, but it also provides information about the, the whole family of that one individual. When we compile or transfer PHI across data sets, it can be increasingly difficult to respect that variety of cultural norms. Education becomes an important part about um, making sure that we have good privacy practices in place, and every organization should have a privacy management program. We discussed this in the white paper as well. Um, this is obviously a role for health information management professionals across the globe, and organizations which collect, use, or disclose health information are expected to have key components of a privacy accountability program. Those key components include privacy awareness training, including education of the patient about their privacy rights and responsibilities, having policies, procedures, and other written documentation, auditing and compliance, privacy officer or compliance officer roles of responsibilities and accountability, and of course, a privacy incident management program. The white paper provides additional information and resources to assist you to develop a privacy management program for your organization. We've talked about the case studies um, in the white paper, and we have six case studies, and I think that this is a unique contribution to the white paper and provides exceptional uh, value. I strongly encourage you to download the white paper and make sure that you review those case studies. So the case studies include um, my health record from the Australian experience about implementing um, a national health record, general data protection regulations of the European Union reaches far beyond Europe, healthcare privacy, an Indian scenario, Developing a Global Standard for Health Information Privacy Workforce Education, a Republic of Korea, South Korea, case study. The Health Information Exchange Implementation in Qatar, the HIE Consent Model for Privacy Concerns and Privacy Regulatory Framework, 
and laying the foundation for privacy practice and compliance in the outpatient setting, policies and procedures case study from the U.S. So I want to remind you to be able to download the URLs um, from Bright Talks platform here so that you can access and download the um, Data Governance White Paper and the IFHEMA White Paper on privacy. Now, if you have any questions for either Lorraine or I, you can certainly enter them into the chat here in Bright Talk. And while we're waiting for questions to appear, um, Lorraine, I'm going to move us to our um, little graphic here about the steps for privacy, our pro emerging privacy trends. Whoops, one too many. Okay. And did you want to speak to that? Um, I will, but for, first I'll make a brief message of GDPR. I happen to uh, write the case study about GDPR with my colleague Angelica Handel from Germany. And we had interesting discussion in Dubai a couple of months ago about what GDPR means to healthcare. And I thought it might interest those on the line today. The health information professionals and the health informatics professionals that were in the audience said that, you know, while each nation of the EU had existing policy and regulation and process and documentation requirements, there are a couple of components of the GDPR that are particularly challenging to healthcare. When you talk about, you know, the right to be forgotten, the amendment rights that go with GDPR and some of the other components, it becomes particularly challenging in a healthcare organization, as you would already guess, that care is given based upon previous documentation, what the patient uh, shares during that particular event of care, and you can't easily or maybe appropriately talk about amendments without the right way to do amendments. Hence, Jean's comment about you have to have policy and process in place. And then when you think about <clears throat> the right to be forgotten, the impact of what that might mean to the longitudinal record of a patient, and then you take it the next leg of the thought process and you think about the liability that can be created both to the patient and to the provider when you don't have all that relevant past history of a patient. So some interesting conversations going on with my European colleagues as they address and, and fully implement GDPR in Europe, and then obviously a lot of the rest of the world is in fact modeling updated regulations based upon the GDPR. So that little segue, Jean, before I talk about uh, the slide about preparing for emerging privacy trends. With the work group, what we did is devise these six steps while we wrote from the viewpoint of a health information management professional. I think these six key steps to preparing for emerging privacy trends apply far broader than the health information management or maybe ministries of health or technology vendors out there. So certainly take a look at this graphic. Think about the key steps in here of getting involved, and you've certainly shown already how you're doing that, by being on this webcast, assessing your environment, communicating, and the other steps that are here. And Jean certainly has already talked about the importance of training, which we certainly can't emphasize enough. It is so essential for compliance and for the safety, security, and building the trust around the confidentiality of health information. The other note from this slide, you'll see the link of how you can access through the IFHEMA website and actually download this white paper. You will need to sign up for it through our contact management system. We hope you do that. You will then periodically get an update from us as we publish our newsletters and have new information out there. 
and you'll have the opportunity to join IFEMA as an individual member or a corporate member, uh, which I would suspect might apply to those on the line today. So there are membership opportunities. It's only $35 a year to belong to IFEMA, so our due structure is not high. So consider doing that as you sign up for the white paper and read some of this very rich content that Jean and everyone involved in this work group developed. So Jean, any other comments or questions from the audience here? I don't see uh, any questions yet from the audience. Um, I think that you know, I'm, I'm one of the self-proclaimed privacy wonks, so I think that privacy is really important. Um, in part of my cons consultation work, I'm constantly uh, being told by people that work in the field um, that, you know, they've been a nurse or a doctor or a dentist for, you know, a whole career, and they understand about privacy, but they don't understand some of the really basic steps about making sure that um, they understand they understand the patient-provider um, relationship, and if they look up a patient's information in their record, that they would never consider telling it to anybody else, but they don't realize that looking up that information uh, without having a need to provide that health service at that point in time, that itself is a privacy breach. So the concept about providing education is we need to be able to provide lots of bits and pieces of that privacy information, um, and people will pick it up and listen to it uh, in different ways. So they understand this part, but that part is new to them. So we have to keep changing the way that we share that message because I'm uh, reinforced every day uh, from comments that I receive that not everybody understands it in the way that it was intended. Thank you for your comments. I'm looking forward for you, for you to download your, your white paper as well, and uh, we look forward to your comments about that. Thank you. We wish you all a great day, and thank you for joining us, unless there's a question that comes in shortly here, because we've addressed now the couple that came in. So don't forget to download the white paper. There is contact information within the paper of how you can communicate with Jean or I or IFEMA formally. So I wish you a great day. Back to you, Jean. Thank you for joining us for the Bright Talk presentation today. January 28th is Data Privacy Day, so I'll wish you all an early Data Privacy Day. This is Jean Eaton and Lorraine Fernandez, and uh, we look forward to thanking you for joining us today. Thank you much.